Today we're going to talk about chapter 11 from our book, which is about within subjects designs, also known as within groups designs. So what is a within subjects design? Well, it's when uh, people are assigned to every treatment condition. So more than one treatment condition, actually they're assigned to every treatment condition. They participate in every aspect of the study. What is the statistical concept of power? It's the ability to detect the independent variable's effect on the dependent variable. Um, in terms of hypothesis testing, it's our ability to reject a null hypothesis that is in fact false, which is what we want to do in our experiment. Uh, the null hypothesis says that our independent variable has no effect, and the alternative hypothesis says that it does. We want to be able to correctly reject the uh, null hypothesis, and statistical power allows us to do that. Why is it desirable? Um, well, uh, it helps us to detect these small effects. Now, let me give you an example of this, because uh, if you have too much power, you really detect, as it says, meaningless differences. Um, there's been research on taking an aspirin a day, and this was based on an initial study of 40,000 men who had already had a first heart attack, and how well good that, that prevented a second heart attack. When you have 40,000 men in a study, uh, small effects just pop out, and so their ability to not have a second heart attack is significant. Um, there's all kinds of external validity or generalizability issues with a study like this, though, because people will say, well, everybody should take an aspirin a day. Well, they're basing that on studies of men, so women have different dosages, perhaps, and they're men who've had a first heart attack, which, again, most people haven't had one. And so uh, maybe everyone shouldn't take an aspirin a day. Here's the other problem with statistical power is uh, you don't, how many lives would really be saved by everyone taking an aspirin a day? So is it, is it desirable? What, you know, how large are these effects? The problem is that everybody take, if everybody takes an aspirin a day, some people are going to die from taking an aspirin a day. And so what's the net savings? Um, it's about 6 to 12 uh, lives saved per year uh, out of the U.S. population, so not a lot. So why do we call within subjects experiments repeated measures designs? It's because we take repeated measures of the same people, because we're uh, measuring them in every possible condition, hence the term repeated measures design. So what are some of the basic principles of a within subjects design? Well. People serve as their own control, and uh, this is a huge advantage of within subjects, within groups, designs. Uh, the reason why is because no one's more like you than you are, because wherever you go, there you are. Now, um, being able to serve as your own control is a huge advantage. Uh, between subjects, between groups, designs use random assignment to try to ensure group equivalence, but you can never be really sure that your groups are equivalent to each other. Within subjects, within groups, designs solve this problem because each person acts as their own control. Each person's compared to themselves. That is a very, very powerful uh, technique. Uh, it really trumps anything else. Uh, it assigns subjects to all levels. Oh, in a factorial design, right. So factorial means more than one independent variable. If it's within subjects factorial design, then you're, you're in... You're in every condition, again, as we said before. A mixed design is kind of tricky. Uh, this is when at, uh, at least one of the independent variables is run between subjects and one is run um, within subjects. My dissertation was a mixed design, too. But this is how things get complicated. Let me give you an example of an experiment on taste testing flavored colas in different regions of the country. So one independent variable is the flavor of the cola, and the other is the region of the country. Uh, let's talk about region of the country first. So you can taste, or well, you're going to have people taste test, say, five or six different um, flavored colas, and we could test them in the Midwest, East Coast, um, Pacific Northwest, the South, the Dirty South, California, Texas, etc., all the different regions of the country. That is going to be, you have to run people 
uh, between subjects, between groups for region because you can only live in one place. And so you don't have people who live in every region. And so that is a between subjects variable. Flavor of the colas, though, you could run either within or between. I'll give you an example of both. Let's say we have the flavored colas we have are uh, cherry, vanilla, cherry, vanilla, uh, chocolate, strawberry, watermelon, coconut, and honey um, flavored Coke. Now, what we could do is we could give each person one of those flavors, okay, and have them rate it for how good it tastes or um, however else you want to rate it. That would be running it as a between subjects, between groups design. Because um, they're only tasting one flavored cola. We could also run it as a within subjects design, where they taste every cola. And then you, or they maybe they rank order them too, or they rate them on a 1 to 10 scale. Um, but that's running it within subjects because everybody is tasting every cola. And so it would be a mixed design if everyone tastes every cola, but um, they're in different regions of the country because flavor is a within subjects variable, region is a between subjects variable. What are the advantages of within subjects designs? Uh, let's take each of these in turn. Uh, you use fewer people. That's a huge advantage when you're trying to recruit people to be in your study. Uh, if training is required, you do save a lot of time in a within subjects design. Uh, the reason why is because you can train one group of people and then run them in every condition. So, for example, mnemonic training. Uh, it's tough to, tr to train a whole bunch of people in how to use mnemonics. You can just train one group of people and then just put them in every uh, treatment group. Um, Greater statistical power, again, each person acts as their own control. They're, it's a perfect matched design. People are matched against themselves. And you get a more complete um, record of their behavior because you see them in every treatment condition. Um, here's a good metaphor, or maybe it's a simile, but between subjects, between groups designs are like a snapshot of behavior because you see people in one condition. Within subjects, within groups designs are more like a movie because... Uh, you can put all the snapshots together because uh, you're seeing them in every possible condition. So if they're so great, what are the disadvantages? Well, people have to be in the study a longer time. Um, people are more likely to drop out of within subjects, within groups designs. And you also have problems with progressive error, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, resetting equipment might take time uh, between your conditions. Again, it's taking longer. Um, certain treatments might interfere with other treatments, later treatments, uh, so you might have a carryover effect. If you have a carryover effect, though, you must run the study as between subjects or between groups. So it's not really a disadvantage as much as it is an elimination right there. Um, and treatment orders can confound your results true. That is true, but that's easily solved through counterbalancing, which we'll talk about um, in a minute. So when can't we use a within subjects design? Well, if you're doing something that creates a permanent change, you can't use a within subjects design because you can't put people in every condition. For example, uh, research has been done with rats where they lesion the ventromedial uh, hypothalamus. Uh, it's the satiation center in the brain. Uh, it's when you know that you've had enough to eat. Um, and so the, the rats never feel full. Maybe you've seen pictures of them in your textbook. Uh, a normal rat looks like a normal rat, and then one with vent ventromedial hypothalamic damage is enormous. Uh, the problem is that can't be reversed. You can't put people, you can't put back what you took out uh, of the ventromedial hypothalamus. And so you have to run that as a between subjects design. You can't run it as a within subjects design. Order effects are an issue in within subjects designs. Uh, they can be positive or negative, uh, and so the term that we use is uh, progressive error. Actually, you usually get both. You get pr practice effects and boredom effects, uh, but we call that progressive error because as people progress through the study, um, uh, the belief is that it grows. So counterbalancing is how we deal with it. Uh, you can control order effects. You can't eliminate progressive error but you can distribute it across your treatment conditions. And so that's what we're really trying to do here. Um, how do we do it? Well, 
the two major strategies are subject by subject counterbalancing, which I've never seen used in reality. It only exists in textbooks. Um, or across subjects counterbalancing, which is pretty much used exclusively. Um, but uh, let's talk about both. The fatigue effect um, is a form of progressive error. Uh, you're tired, you're bored, you're irritated. Uh, you're in the study, you're in every condition, you're like, this again? Um, and so your performance declines. Um, but your behavior could also, or your, your performance could actually get better due to practice effects. So it might be you're in every condition, and so you're like, this again? Oh, I know how to do this. And so your, your, um, your performance is better. Taking an ACT prep class is basically a positive progressive error because it's a practice effect. The more familiar you are with taking standardized tests, generally the better that you do. So um, I'm not trying to shut down the Kaplan ACT test prep company, but you can accomplish a lot just by taking it again and again. So what are practice effects? Um, increased familiarity with the equipment or task. Uh, this is completely true, as I said uh, earlier. We can't eliminate um, order effects um, because as soon as you have two treatments, whoops, wait a minute. There we go, sorry. Uh, we can't eliminate treatment effects, order effects, because as soon as we have two or more treatments, um, we've screwed it up. And we can't always give people the same order. Uh, I mean, why not just give people, everybody in the study the same order? A, B, A, and then B, and then C. Well, if B is always following A, and C is always following B, that's a confound right there in your study. And so that's problematic. So, subject by subject counterbalancing. Oh my heavens. Okay, let's talk about this. Um, this keeps the people in the design even longer. And so that's one of the problems with within subjects designs. Um, subject by subject counterbalancing exacerbates that. Um, reverse counterbalancing. Let's talk about this. So if you have two conditions, A and B, you run people in A and then B and then B again and then A again. Uh, a shout out to the Swedish supergroup ABBA on that one. Here's the idea behind it. The first A has one unit of progressive error. The first B has two units of progressive error. The second B has three units of progressive error. And the fourth B, or excuse me, uh, second A, fourth treatment, has four units of progressive error. And so you're assuming that progressive area error is a linear function uh, you end up with, for condition A, five units of progressive error, one plus four, the first and fourth treatment, and for condition B, five units of progressive error, the second and third treatment condition. And so it's really kind of a, oh, I've never seen it used. Nonlinear progressive error um, is different. The, the previous example uh, was linear progressive error. This is like when maybe people get a second wind or a third wind from being in the study and they forget how bored they are and their performance actually picks up. Uh, and that's what nonlinear progressive error um, is. Why can't reverse counterbalancing control for this? Um, well, because if, if the progressive error occurs in a, great, in a straight line, this would confound it. Sure, uh, as I said, nobody uses it anyway. Block randomization is subject by subject counterbalancing. You give them um, blocks of treatments, okay? So it's a different random sequence, but you're still in each treatment condition multiple times. And so that, that doesn't go away um, in subject by subject counterbalancing. So each, each person gets uh, and is in each treatment several times. This results in a long duration, expensive or boring procedure. Uh, yep. That's why no one uses it, um, and I'm glad that we're taking so much time talking about something that no one uses. So, let's switch to the real world where people use across subjects counterbalancing, and the two techniques are complete and partial um, uh, counterbalancing. Um, it really depends on how many treatment conditions you have. Uh, that determines whether you use um, complete or incomplete or partial counterbalancing. 
complete counterbalancing uses all possible treatment sequences an equal number of times. So let's say you have two treatment conditions, again, A and B. What you do is half of the people get A and then B, and the other half of the people in your study get B and then A. Voila! It's done. Um, that's an easy way to run your study, and that's the way most people do. Partial counterbalancing is, uh, or sometimes called incomplete counterbalancing. It's used when you have four or more treatment conditions. Um, it, the reason why we use this is complete counterbalancing is impractical when you have, say, four or five treatment conditions or more. Uh, the reason why is because it's, it's essentially a factorial problem. Uh, that's why it's got the little end there with the, the exclamation point. It's a factorial issue. If you have four different treatment conditions, A, B, C, and D, let's say, um, it's four times three times two times one is the number of different treatment orders. So there's 24 different treatment orders that you would have to create uh, if you did complete counterbalancing. If you had five conditions, five times four times three times two times one, uh, there's 120 different treatment orders that you'd have to run people through. That's just impractical. Uh, in 120, that, I mean, everybody's in their own different treatment order if you want to do it complete counterbalancing. So you, uh, if you have two treatment conditions or three treatment conditions, you do complete counterbalancing. If you have four or more treatment conditions, you do um, partial or incomplete counterbalancing. And finishing up here, um, yeah, as I said earlier, if you have carryover effects, then you have to use a between subjects or between groups design. But keeping that in mind, researchers use within subjects or within groups designs whenever they can. Uh, basically, the advantages we talked about are enormous. They, they swamp any problems that between subjects, uh, between groups designs have. So... That wraps up chapter 11, and thanks for listening.